Thank you for joining the July Education Seminar on Music and Health. My housekeeping uh, notes are as follows. All of your lines are automatically muted. If you are online to unmute or viewing the webinar online, you can unmute your line um, by using the icon towards the top of the screen. Um, if you are only on by phone, you can push pound six. Uh, if you have a question and you are online, please raise your hand using the icon at the top or you can unmute your phone line, like I mentioned, using pound six. Um, and just always want to remind folks that the information in the presentation is not a substitute for any sort of medical advice or treatment, um, and consultation with your doctor or healthcare professional is always strongly recommended. Um, so, Kathy, if you're there, feel free to take it away. Thanks, Kisri. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. All right. Thanks for doing the housekeeping. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, again, welcome to our July webinar on music and your health. Um, so many people today listen to music, and we want to share with you some of the benefits of music and how you can both enjoy it and add it to your health. Uh, you'll also learn about music as therapy today. Our speaker is Megan Masco, who has her doctorate degree and is a board-certified music therapist. She has a background in juvenile justice, oncology, palliative, and hospice care. She is an assistant professor at IUPUI whose research focuses on how and why music therapy decreases pain, anxiety, and spiritual distress in people living with cancer. At this point, um, I'd like to turn the program over to Megan. hearing myself talk. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about what music therapy is, and then we'll um, go from there. So music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music to accomplish individualized goals. That's a really broad definition. I'm not going to read the whole thing because you can read. But it's a broad definition because music therapists work with people all across the lifespan who have all kinds of needs. So in my professional life up to this point, I've worked with um, young children who had developmental disorders. I've worked with adults with intellectual disabilities. I've worked with um, teenagers in the juvenile justice system. The bulk of my clinical practice has been working with adults in oncology and then also in end-of-life care. And sometimes that does include pediatric um, hospice and palliative care. Not that often, but sometimes it does. Um, I, music therapists are like me. They're board certified. Um, there are some states that also require licensure or registry. So the reason I'm a licensed music therapist is because I moved to Indiana from the state of North Dakota, and North Dakota requires licensure to practice music therapy in the state. Um, in addition, uh, when somebody wants to become a board certified music therapist, they have to complete at least 1,200 supervised clinical hours prior to taking the board certification exam. And music therapists gain most of those hours through a six-month full-time internship. My internship was kind of a goofy one. Um, that's how I got my introduction into juvenile justice. I was working in the juvenile justice system in the state of Iowa, as well as for a hospice and palliative care agency. So by the time somebody graduates, with a degree in music therapy and they pass their board certification exam, that person has a minimum of 3,000 hours of training. So music therapists are very highly trained people. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how music affects people emotionally, psychologically, physically, um, and spiritually. So, oh, yep, you can go ahead and go forward, Chrissy. Thanks. So the population serve, you can see that there's, most of it is actually other, this other category. And that's because a lot of music therapists work in private practice. And um, when you work in private practice, you might work with multiple populations, or you might work with some populations that don't normally pop up um, in other places where folks practice. But we do have a pretty significant percentage of music therapists who work in medical and surgical settings. That includes hospitals, um, outpatient clinics, uh, partial hospitalization. And we do have a lot of music therapists who work in mental health. Music therapy as a discipline in, the, in its current iteration really got its start 
um, in what is now the VA system. So music therapists started out working with soldiers coming back from World War I and then again coming back from World War II. And um, then music therapists sort of moved from the hospital system to education, and now we have more and more hospitals that are hiring music therapists, and the VA system is once again hiring music therapists because we have so many um, veterans who are returning from the battlefield with multiple injuries, including post-traumatic stress disorder. So you can go ahead and move forward. Thanks. So the most common places of employment, um, you'll notice that um, dialysis center is not on the list <laughs> because a dialysis center might be a part of a larger um, community-based agency. It might be part of a larger hospital. Uh, but a lot of music therapists, especially in the state I live in, in Indiana, are in private practice. But hospice is actually the largest growing area for music therapists to work. But it's pretty much tied with K-12 schools, um, the VA, and children's hospitals. Those are the places where you're most likely to find music therapists. And it tends to be in larger cities. Um, Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis has three and a half music therapists. And the IU Simon Cancer Center has one music therapist, so it tends to be those larger places. Um, Peyton Manning Children's Hospital also has a music therapist on staff at their hospital. You can see all the various places where music therapists work. We, have, we all study the same competencies and the same skill set, but then we learn how to apply those skills in sometimes very, very different clinical settings. You can go ahead and go forward, Christy. Thanks. So how does somebody become a music therapist? Uh, you have to go to a school that's accredited, and our schools are accredited by the National Association of Schools of Music. I just got to go through a fun reaccreditation process uh, for our program. And then our curricula are actually approved by our professional association, which is the American Music Therapy Association. I don't think I put it on here, but if you're interested, their website is musictherapy.org, and that'll take you to our professional association website. Um, our curricula are competency-based because we need our students to be able to do things. We need our students to be able to think on their feet and problem solve and think critically, and we need them to know how to use music in lots of different situations and when to know when not to use music because music can sometimes be contraindicated for people, and sometimes um, music is actually not safe for some of our patients. So we have to know when that is too. So our curricula are all competency-based. It's about what our students can do. Um, and then in order for somebody to be able to sit for their board certification exam, they have to have completed an approved program. Uh, so they have to go to an approved school and study an approved curriculum in order to be eligible to take that board certification exam after they complete their approved internship. All right. So some of the primary reasons for referral. And um, this survey, I love being able to cite the research of friends of mine, and Kara Groen is a friend of mine from graduate school, um, and she actually did a survey of nurses trying to figure out why they referred people for music therapy services, and this was primarily in palliative care, but in other studies that have been done since then, the reasons for referral are pretty much the same, and the, the number one reason for referral is actually for spiritual support. And that's probably not surprising because a lot of people find a great deal of spiritual meaning in music, um, as well as the way that organized religions use music to enhance um, the worship experiences, no matter what that religion might be. There are some exceptions, of course. There are some religions that don't use music, but they're, they're pretty small, um, and they, have, they tend to take care of their own folks. So anxiety is the second reason followed very closely by physical pain, depression, and socialization. Um, and those things all sort of tend to feed into each other. You know, when we're anxious, we tend to feel like our pain is worse. Um, when our pain is worse, we tend to feel more emotionally depressed. And anxiety and depression are kissing cousins. And uh, if you consider yourself to be a spiritual person, when you're anxious and in pain and feeling depressed, it's very easy to wind up in what we call spiritual distress. So those are the primary reasons for referral. They're certainly not the only ones. They're just the ones that happen to come up the most often when we're working with adults primarily. OK, Christy. So 
So I want to talk a little bit about music therapy and health. And this is a really broad stroke, broad brush. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat so that I can see them and answer them as we go along. Um, when we talk about music therapy and health, you know, music therapy can be a lot of things. Um, but there are some things also that it isn't. And you may have heard about iPod programs and nursing homes, um, or you may have heard about, you know, community drum circles. Well, iPod programs are not considered to be music therapy. In order for something to be considered music therapy, there needs to be interaction between a therapist and a client. So we talk about the therapy triangle in music therapy. And um, one side of the triangle is the client, one side is the music therapist, and the third side is the music itself, and how those three sides of the triangle interact with each other. So there are some things that are music therapy, and there are some things that aren't. Um, these um, research studies that I'm going to talk a little bit about are really about music therapy. So there's a therapist involved, um, but there are certainly benefits that come from participating in music yourself. It's just that we don't have as much research about those. So um, blood pressure, as you know, blood pressure is hugely important. We want to make sure that we're taking care of our blood pressure because it keeps our hearts healthy, it helps reduce the risk of stroke. Um, so one of the things that happens when adults, in particular, participate in what's known as the Bonnie Method of Guided Imagery in Music, um, there was a particular study done by Kathy McKinney down south, and um, folks who participated in this particular music therapy approach, which uses recorded music, previously recorded classical music specifically, to help people work through an imagery experience, um, Dr. McKinney found that patients who participated, we call them patients, people who participated in those sessions actually had reduced systolic blood pressure. That's one study. There actually was another study that was done, and I'm, I've just blanked on the name of the author, but the basic gist of it was that when we take people and they have um, what you might call a, a mountain experience or um, the technical term is frisson, when sort of the hair stand up on your arms, when you have a musical experience that is so moving that it causes you to have goosebumps, essentially, that also reduces your systolic blood pressure. And not only does listening to music like that that has that kind of effect on you lower your systolic blood pressure, but it actually decreases cortisol. And cortisol is an inflammatory marker in the body. Um, so if your cortisol levels are up, it's typically because you have inflammation in your body. Um, if any of you are asthmatic, like I am, occasionally you may have to actually take cortisol and artificially raise your cortisol levels in order to reduce the inflammation in your lungs in your bronchial tubes. So that's, I have to do that. I have to take cortisol um, usually once or twice a year um, to help reduce the inflammation in my lungs. So cortisol and, and long-term exposure to cortisol is really quite bad for you. It makes it difficult for your immune system to function properly. Um, it makes it difficult for you to heal. And it makes it, um, it, it makes it difficult for you to recover if you do get an infection. So I have a lot of students, I'm a college professor, and I have students who you know, work themselves and work themselves and work themselves, and then we get to finals week, and when they really, really need to be healthy because they have finals, that's when they get sick because they've sustained this level of stress for so long that, that their immune system is now kaput. So we want to make sure that we're keeping our systolic blood pressure low and that we're keeping those cortisol levels down low. And again, one of the ways we can do that is through the Bonnie Method of Guided Imagery in Music, and one of the ways that we can do that is through having those what they call peak musical experiences. Um, more generally, when people receive music therapy services, and this is typically live music, so this is a therapist there with one or more instruments actually interacting with the client or the patient, um, the patients re respond that they have less pain. They feel less pain and they feel less anxious when music is going on. And I see this happen in my own clinical practice. I work specifically with patients who are actually getting chemotherapy. Um, so the process 
is probably going to sound pretty familiar to some of you. They have, they have long days in the chair. Um, they're hooked up to lots of IVs. This is a long process. Um, it's a pretty boring process, too, but it's also quite nerve-wracking. And so patients tend to report that they come in with pretty high levels of anxiety. They might not have very high levels of pain. Some of them do. Some chemotherapy actually is quite uncomfortable. But um, as we're working together, we get to the end of the session, no matter what it is that I've been doing, whether I've been providing live music or we've actually been making music together, um, sometimes I have patients who will say, just, just make up something for me. And so I do on the spot. Um, I will improvise music right there, typically on the guitar and with voice. So after those sessions, uh, my patients report to me that they have less pain and they have less anxiety. So sort of the flip side of having decreased cortisol, of decreasing cortisol and reducing systolic blood pressure and decreasing pain and anxiety, all of which are markers of stress, the flip side of that is that when um, people receive music therapy services, they actually have better immune system function. So we can, there are um, ways that we can swab people's mouths. The one I'm thinking about requires a swab. So we swab people's mouths and we go and we look for specific biomarkers. This one's called salivary immunoglobulin A, or SIGA. And after people receive music therapy services, um, in the, we've seen this in the hospital research um, has shown this in actually in people who have dental anxiety, so if anybody has dental anxiety, um, and healthy adults as well. So when people receive music therapy services, again, typically live music or um, this imagery process that I talked about earlier, those patients actually have um, higher levels of salivary immunoglobulin A, which means that their immune system is actually functioning more efficiently. So what's exciting about this idea of reducing systolic blood pressure and reducing cortisol levels, decreasing pain and anxiety, and improving immune function is that at least for systolic blood pressure, cortisol, and the immune function, those effects tend to last for at least a little while. Um, I saw there's one study that shows that those effects last can, can last for up to two weeks. Um, that was probably a fluke. I've never seen that study replicated. But um, it's even in the short term, if we can help people reduce their blood pressure and reduce those inflammatory markers and decrease perceptions of pain and anxiety and increase immune function, that means that people are just generally healthier. And then we also increase levels of social and spiritual support for people. And we don't, there aren't any biomarkers for that, really. Uh, but we get that information from self-report. People just tell us that they feel better. Um, and they do enjoy, I have actually had a couple of times where I've had physicians or nurses come in and actually jam with me and a patient <laughs> while they were going through chemo. Um, that was in inpatient chemo. Um, I'm going to go ahead. It's, I didn't make a slide for this, but I do want to talk just a little bit about when we make music together, because we are going to talk about that in a second. There are some new studies that have come out just within the last five years that look at what happened to us as biological beings when we make music together in group. And so there's been research looking at when people play together in bands and orchestras and when people sing together. And what's fascinating about this is that when we as human beings come together to create music together, we actually biologically fall into sync with one another. And you've probably seen this happen. Um, maybe you were at a Fourth of July parade and a marching band came by. And you may have noticed yourself sort of tapping your toes along with the band, or the kids around you may have started dancing in time with the band or marching in time with the band. Um, well, what happens is we know now from research that our brains, our brain waves actually synchronize with one another. And it's called entrainment. That's the fancy term for it. But when we look at people's brainwave patterns that are making music together, we quite literally start thinking together. Our brains start processing information together. So our brainwave patterns look very similar. Um, our heart rates tend to fall into sync with one another. Um, as do our respiration rate. Now, the respiration rate makes a lot of sense because if you've ever played an instrument or sung in a choir, 
you know that everybody's pretty much, everybody within a little section of the band, the orchestra or the choir, is either bowing together or breathing together because they have to sing or play together. Um, so we do have some more recent data that shows us that when we're participating in musical events together, that we actually, um, we actually wind up synchronizing our biological rhythms with one another, which I think is really fascinating. Um, we don't know why human beings are musical. I teach a class on that. It's called, uh, it's a music and neuroscience class, a cognitive neuroscience class. And at the very beginning of that class, I get up and I say, so this semester we're going to try to answer the question, why are human beings musical? The answer is we don't know, but we have several excellent theories. And so this idea that human beings actually entrain with one another um, might be one of the reasons why human beings are musical. Maybe it helps. Um, maybe it helps tribes stay together when we were um, cavemen trying to fight off saber-toothed tigers. Okay, Christy, go ahead and move on to the next slide. So this is kind of a boring slide. I'm just going to go through it very quickly. Um, so when a music therapist comes to visit, the first thing we do is we conduct a music therapy assessment. And some of the things that we look at, the first thing we always want to know is what is the kind of music that the person prefers? Um, because people have what are called idiosyncratic responses to music. And that means that if I were to play, I'm going to pick a piece of music. Let's say I play, um, gosh, I'm terrible with country music because I'm not a country music fan. So I'm just going to get that out of the way. So if you came in and you played, um, let's say, Britney Spears. Okay, let's say if somebody came in and played Britney Spears. There might be a few people in this group who had a really positive response to it. They might like it. Um, they might sort of start bopping around. They might know the words to some of it. But there's probably a larger group of people who either A, don't know it, B, don't like it, or C, don't care. And all of our research about how music affects the body and how music affects people indicates that liking a piece of music that's being used to, for, with you is really important. So remember I said that our immune system, our immune function can improve when we have experiences with music that we really enjoy. And I said that our cortisol levels can decrease. Well, the flip side of that is true as well. So if, so if I were to come in and let's say that um, you really love Mozart and I came in and I started blasting ACDC at you, but you don't like ACDC, you really like Mozart, um, you're not going to receive any benefit from it. So understanding musical preference is really important because people are idiosyncratic. We all have very different tastes. Um, and so it's important for us to hone in on the music that you enjoy or that you at least prefer. I'm not, I definitely don't want to go in and use music that you don't like. And this is important. Music therapists talk about harm and about mitigating harm for people. And we sometimes tend to think as a society that music is, is non-threatening and that there's no way that music could hurt people. Well, that's actually not true. And every government on the planet uses music as a torture device from time to time. And I, I remember when I believe it was um, Noriega, who just died, um, was actually the United States government blasted hard rock music at him because he hated it and it was used as a torture device. And I'm sure that um, I think Christy said that she's been listening to the Moana soundtrack forever and ever and ever. Um, I'm pretty sure this isn't the Moana soundtrack, but I'm pretty sure that if I hear Let It Go one more time from uh, Frozen, I I'm, I'm pretty sure my cortisol levels are going to go through the roof. So musical preference is important because it can have these really profound physical responses and psychological and emotional responses with people. So musical preference is very important. We want to maximize the possibility of positive effects while mitigating harm as much as possible. So one of the ways that we do that is we look for the way people respond to music. Sometimes people will tell us that they like a piece of music or they don't care about a piece of music, but a really good music therapist will look at their physical cues and know whether or not something is actually a good fit for that person. And, and to be honest, I'm often in a situation with my particular patients with whom I work. Um, some of them can't talk to me. So my patients who are at end-of-life care, in end-of-life care, 
sometimes can't tell me what their musical preferences are. And so I have to look for responses from them um, to see what the right piece of music might be. So we look at physical changes. We look at things like posture and facial expressions. Um, we look at uh, respiration. Sometimes I have patients who are um, on O2 monitors, and so I'll look at their oxygen saturation, their respiration rate, I said. There are changes, any, any changes in cognition or communication. So does the person start talking to me more? Do they stop talking to me? Were they talking to me before, and now they have, want nothing to do with me? Um, did they have disorganized speech before, meaning that it didn't make a lot of sense? And now they're speaking in complete sentences, or they're using phrases that make sense. Um, so social changes, is the person um, opening up about social issues, or is the person allowing people to come visit them? I use music a lot to help encourage um, interactions between family members, and sometimes in between people who are living in the same facility. So if I go to a nursing home or a long-term care facility, you know, sometimes I'll very purposefully go out into a public area of the facility to start making music with people because I want other people to come. And I actually have a group. I work with some adults with developmental disabilities in the Indianapolis area. And one of the things we do is group music making because these folks can be very, become very socially isolated, and we want them to be more socially integrated. Um, and then spiritual changes, that's, I, people really have to tell me. Um, and often people will tell me that they find music to be very um, spiritually or religiously uplifting or satisfying, or it makes them feel like there's a connection to something beyond themselves. OK, Christy, you can go ahead and move forward. OK, so what are some sample music therapy interventions? And then I'm going to talk about, I believe the slide after that is stuff that you can do and that I would really encourage you to do. Um, so the first one that I use is music-assisted relaxation. And I use this a lot with people who are having, maybe they're having difficulty sleeping. Um, I've actually used it myself. And I, I trained my son from a fairly young age to do music-assisted relaxation at nighttime because my son is um, very, very high-functioning autistic. But he, does, he has a very difficult time sleeping. Um, and so training him to use music-assisted relaxation has really helped him be able to get the sleep that he needs so that he can be healthy. So music-assisted relaxation, there are a couple of different things that we do. One of them is where um, I might use music and progressive muscle relaxation, meaning that if I were working with a specific client one-on-one -on -one, or even in a group, I prefer to use live music when I'm doing this, and I tend to use my guitar because my guitar is pretty portable. So I will often play guitar, usually just sort of a nice soothing pattern in the background. Well, I give people directions on um, flexing and releasing different muscle groups. So often starting at the toes, going up through the forehead, and then back down through the body so that we can tense and release all of those muscles. Now, what makes music-assisted relaxation different than, say, just doing it on your own is um, I actually will tailor the music. So when I want people to tense up their muscles, I'll, I'll make the music a little bit more tense. I'll throw some notes in there that add a little um, what we call harmonic tension to the chord. And then when I want people to release their muscles, I'll actually resolve those um, tones that I've inserted to make the music sound more tense so that the music itself sounds more sort of open and relaxed. Um, you can use, you can do music assisted relaxation, this music and progressive muscle relaxation. You don't have to have a music therapist there with you. Um, this is certainly something that you could do at home and um, with, with whatever your favorite relaxing music is. Um, for me, I don't, I don't play the guitar for myself and do progressive muscle relaxation, and I don't play it for my son. Um, but over the years, we've used a few pieces of music. Um, we've used po the Pachelbel Canon. Uh, is one piece that he's, that's been really successful for my son. Um, I personally am a fan of a composer named Eric Satie. And he has a series of pieces called the Gymnopédie. And they are beautiful piano pieces. And that's, that's personally what I like to use. So that's music and progressive muscle relaxation. 
where we pair the tensing and relaxation of muscles with music. Something else that we do is music and imagery. Now, there are, in music therapy world, there are two different kinds of music imagery. There's the body method of guided imagery in music, which is when we use pre-recorded music to help people work through an imagery experience. Um, that requires, that's, that's a psychiatric intervention, and that requires a great deal of training. Um, you actually go and get additional training and additional certification in that approach. And then there is what we just call music and imagery. And music and imagery is more like, um, I, let's say that I might use, oh gosh, um, how about the Beethoven Moonlight Sonata? Okay, so I would use the Beethoven Moonlight Sonata, and I might have a little script that I read to you about standing in the moonlight um, in a garden, and we would go through this visualization process of something very supportive, a very supportive image um, to sort of help you relax. So in the music-assisted, excuse me, in music and imagery, we use the music to help support sort of this relaxing image that will hopefully um, reduce your stress and anxiety. In music and progressive muscle relaxation, we pair the music with the muscle tensing and relaxation. So both music-assisted relaxation, just a couple of different ways to do it. Um, something else that we do, we, we call it live music for diversion. There's, sometimes I hear people call it live music for alternate attention. We like to make things sound very fancy. The truth of the matter is, is that sometimes we have to have procedures done in the hospital um, that are really unpleasant and, or even mildly unpleasant. And so having a music therapist there can help divert your attention away from the thing that maybe is not so pleasant. So I spend a lot of time working with patients in the chemotherapy suite. So one of the things they have to have done at the beginning of their chemo day is they have to have their port access. It's pretty quick. But it's not the most pleasant thing in the whole wide world if you've ever had a port. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'll do is I'll go in and I, we will actually do some live music so that we can sort of divert their attention away from that. And then the port access tends to be pretty quick and we can move along with the day. Um, I have a friend who worked in a pediatric burn unit for about 20 years. And she used to use live music. She would go in and make live music with the kids while they were having, um, having, excuse me, having their burns debrided or if they needed to have um, baths, which was very painful. So she used live music to help divert their attention away from that so that they didn't need as much pain medication. Um, songwriting for emotional expression. And you may have heard that there are some groups that are popping up throughout the United States that are songwriting groups, and they're specifically aimed at veterans, combat veterans. And I personally am a huge fan of these programs. Um, depending on how they're run, some of them are run by music therapists. Um, some of them are run through the VA. Some of them are not. Some of them are you know, sort of run by volunteers. They might even be run by other combat vets who felt like they got a lot of benefit out of writing songs. Um, again, you know, if it's, we don't call it music therapy unless there's a therapist there, a, a, an appropriately trained therapist there who can help patients work through issues as they come up or help clients work through issues as they come up. But I also am a firm believer in, you know, if, if people feel comfortable writing songs on their own and they feel like it helps them, then good for them. Um, they should do that. So um, songwriting is sort of like um, journaling or writing poetry, maybe writing short stories that you've heard about before. You know, it's, an, it's a way for people to share emotions that they're having that they maybe don't feel safe sharing in another way. And that's something to think about when we talk about how music sort of functions in our society and in our culture. There are a lot of things that are okay to say or think or express when they're in a song that we wouldn't necessarily walk up to somebody and say. Um, so that's, there's a reason why, you know, there's a reason why we use music to express things that we don't feel like we can express otherwise. A good example of that is breakup songs. So if you've ever had a breakup and you've ever listened to breakup songs, 
the reason why breakup songs feel so good or they, they help when you're feeling so bad is because they express a lot of the things that you're feeling that you don't otherwise know how to get out. So songwriting for emotional expression can be a really powerful tool for people. Music facilitated life review is, um, can go a couple of different ways. And I'll tell you a quick story of um, one of my experiences with music facilitated life review. I was asked to go see a couple. This was in palliative care. I was asked to go see a woman um, and her husband. Her husband was having a really difficult time with her being in the hospital. But he didn't want to talk to anybody about it. The chaplain had been, the social worker had been to see him, the nurses had tried talking with him, and he was just kind of shutting down. And um, it was really a problem because the, the medical staff needed to be able to talk to him about his wife's care. And so they, they called me in and said, you know, we don't really know if you can help, but we couldn't think of anything else to do. So we called you. I went in and spoke with the husband and introduced myself and said, hi, I'm Megan. I'm the music therapist. Um, your physician asked me to come see you today. He thought that you might really enjoy listening to some music. And the wife sort of nodded her head yes. The husband didn't say anything. And I, I kind of knew what, I knew what kind of music they liked. And so I sat down and I started to play some Johnny Cash. And I'm pretty sure I started playing I Walk the Line. Well, it turned out that this husband and wife had actually been in a country western band together for years and years and years. And they had done a lot of Johnny Cash, and occasionally they would do, you know, the Johnny Cash, June Carter Cash duos like Jackson. And, um, and he opened up, and he started talking, and he started talking about their life together. And it became very clear that music had been exceptionally important to them as a couple. They actually met because they both joined this band. And um, they had gone to all these dances and played all these dances, and their, their children had grown up singing this music, and now their grandchildren sang this music. So the, the music marked certain points in their lives. The music was very important to them in processing all of the things that had happened throughout their lives. And then this newest challenge with his wife's cancer diagnosis and being in the hospital for so long. So music facilitated life review is when we use live music. Sometimes I'll use recorded music. Um, if there's a piece of music, let's say, um, you know, if it's like a Mozart symphony, I can't play a whole Mozart symphony by myself on the guitar. Not that good. Um, so sometimes I will bring in recorded music if the if the patient or family tells me that that's what they like. But it helps it helps us then talk about what's happening in their lives, what's happened in the past, and sometimes planning for the future. You know, what's the future going to look like? I provide a lot of patient-defined spiritual music. And the reason I say patient-defined is because what one person considers to be really spiritual, another person might just consider to be a, a plain old song. And I was asked to go see a patient one day, and um, she, she said her favorite song was the song Downtown. I can never remember the words without the uh, lyrics in front of me. Anyway, so I was playing this song for her, and all of a sudden she said, oh, I just, I just imagined that that's what heaven's going to look like, like a great big city. And I thought, oh, that's not what I thought we were going to talk about today, but okay. So sometimes people really, um, they find meaning in music that I might not have otherwise found. Um, but it's meaningful to them, and so that provides an opportunity for us, for them to experience connections within themselves. It might be connections with a higher power, connections with other people, connections with, with the natural world, um, or an opportunity to reflect back on their lives. I, I work a lot with people to help create what we call tangible legacies. And this is probably not as important for you, but um, sometimes people want to create, um, they want to create art, you know, for family members. They want to create something that's sort of larger than themselves. And it might be, uh, I have friends who are art therapists who do that, helping people make physical art, and I do it um, making musical art. 
And then I also do a lot of music listening for reality orientation. So something really cool about the human brain is that um, you have sensory systems that are in charge of certain things like sight and smell. Actually, smell is a bad example because smell is very highly pervasive throughout the brain as well. But sight is one. Um, you have speech centers in your brain. We know where those speech centers are. Um, we have the parts of the brain that are for reasoning and decision making. We know where those areas are. There's no such thing as the music spot in the brain. You have auditory cortices, but music is unusual because music is not just processed in the auditory cortex. Music is actually processed in the parts of the brain that are in charge of memory, that are in charge of your reward center. So if you've ever heard of dopamine, um, participating in a musical activity actually releases dopamine. Um, and that uh, dopamine is part of the limbic system of your brain, which is also where memory is. So emotion, memory, sound processing, the speech centers of your brain, your ability to process speech and create speech um, are both affected by music. Um, decision making, the areas of your brain and your frontal lobes that are associated with decision making, those are also activated by music. Um, the vision centers of your brain are activated by music. Your balance <laughs> is activated by music. And actually, your involuntary um, physical processes, so things like respiration and heart rate, music is actually also processed in those parts of the brain. So we know, again, when I teach that class, trying to answer the question, why are human beings musical? And the answer is we don't know, but we have several excellent theories. One of the reasons we know music is really important to, to human survival is because the brain not only has a process for um, us to be able to, not only has a system for us to be able to process music, but we also have backups for that system and backups for that system and backups for the backups for the backups. So even somebody who has severe neurologic damage um, can still process music. And actually, um, one of the ways that we can determine um, how deep a person's coma is is by how they respond to music, which is fascinating in and of itself. So those are some of the things that uh, a music therapist might do with clients. And now, Christy, if you would go ahead and move forward, I think the next slide is about what you can do. Yeah, these are my suggestions for you. So the first thing is listen to your preferred music. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that even just listening to the music that you like on a regular basis, turning on the radio, turning on Pandora, um, firing up the iPhone or the iPod or whatever you have, Listening to your preferred music is good for you. Um, and there's the very real possibility that it will do things like help lower your systolic blood pressure and um, increase your salivary immunoglobulin A levels. There's the very real possibility that it will help reduce your cortisol levels and just generally make you healthier. There, is, there actually is plenty of research that suggests that people who engage in activities that are pleasurable to them that are safe and healthy, okay, not, not drugs and alcohol, but things that are safe and healthy like exercise and music are healthier than people who don't. So the first piece of advice for you is just listen to the music that you like. Um, you can practice music-assisted relaxation, and you actually can probably just Google music-assisted relaxation script. And I'm, I know that there are scripts that are available online um, there are probably, at this point in time, um, things on iTunes that you could download of music in the background with people giving you instructions on how to relax. That's definitely something that you can do to help you, especially if you have difficulty sort of winding down at the end of the day. Um, there is a lot of research from the um, cardiovascular area that shows that music really helps people helps motivate people to exercise. And people who listen to music while they're walking tend to walk further, and they tend to just take more steps. So they tend to take more steps generally throughout the day, and they tend to exercise for longer. And their, the intensity of their exercise tends to be a little bit higher than the people who don't listen to music um, while they're walking. 
or throughout the day. So listen to your preferred music. Hopefully you can do that while you're walking and get some more exercise that way as well. Generally, engaging in creative activities. You know, maybe you don't feel like you're a songwriter. Maybe you don't feel like you're, I, like, I can't draw stick people. My grandmother's a really talented painter, and I, bless her heart, she spent like 20 years of my life trying to turn me into an artist, and really stick people's all I've got. So um, that's not for me. But there might be other creative activities you could engage in. Maybe you like engaging in physical art. Maybe you like um, making pots. Maybe you paint. Um, maybe you make jewelry crochet, knit, cross-stitch, whatever it might be, baking, um, just engage in some kind of creative activity because there actually is ample evidence from the neuroscience side of things and from the psychoneuroimmunology research that shows that engaging in creative activity not only helps preserve brain function, but it actually also does help make you a little bit healthier along the way. Um, attending musical events. And this kind of goes back to number one, listen to your preferred music. If you can, if you feel like you can get out and you can attend musical events, do that. Um, you know, free concerts in the park, or if you have a particular artist that's coming through town that you want to go listen to, please go do that. Because there actually is also something that happens to the audience when they're listening to a piece of music. So not only do the brain waves of the people who are creating the music go into sync with one another, but the brainwaves of the people who are in attendance at that performance, their brainwaves also go into sync with one another. So this is as close to sort of human unity sometimes as we can get. So attend musical events if you can. And, and if it's possible, if you have a music therapist near you, um, I always encourage people to work with a board certified music therapist if that's possible. So I've droned on and on and on. Um, do you have questions for me? I don't see any in the chat. Um, Kathy had asked me how people pay for music therapy services, and that's a whole complicated question in and of itself. Um, dialysis centers that are a part of a hospital may very well have a music therapist who is there, especially if it's a larger hospital. Um, but it gets a little bit tricky. You can use Medicaid waivers to pay for music therapy services, and you can use Medicare to pay for music therapy services, but it usually has to be billed through another agency, and it totally depends on the state in which you live. Private insurance is that way too. It totally depends on the state. Megan, this is Kathy. Hi, Megan, this is Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Um, thank you very much for your presentation um, and for your comment about uh, my question to you, which was much more complicated than I, than I had hoped it would be. Um, one of the things that your presentation reminded me of, though, is that my uh, mother, who is almost 94, lives with me, and she does the the music assisted relaxation because every night she puts a CD on and if she wakes up during the night, I hear the CD music come back on. So, um, you know, it sort of fits with what yeah, you're it, saying. It, it becomes, a, it becomes a conditioned response. Yes, yes, very much so. It's very important to her to have music to listen to. Um, does anyone have any other um, questions or comments or anything that you would like to share about how music has impacted your life before we um, conclude our program today. If you do, you just need to hit pound six or go to the chat. I have a suggestion. Um, this is Christy. Um, now, Kathy already knows this, but I'm a big music person in the sense that I still play clarinet and I'm in a community band and have done band my whole life. But as a suggestion for attending musical events, looking up those sorts of local things, because once I got into community band, I realized that there's these local ensembles everywhere and nine times out of ten, their performances are usually free. Um, so if you are interested in those kinds of live musical events, 
then I would definitely suggest checking out if there are any local community bands in your area because it's easy, free, usually it's at either like a local high school or in the summer, sometimes outdoors. And, and that's such a great suggestion. Um, I'm teaching music appreciation this summer for some undergraduate non-majors and they have to write a concert report. And I had to come up with a list of events that were approved for them to attend about which they could write their concert report. And in coming up with that calendar, I realized exactly what you're saying. How many like local community groups there are, community bands, community choirs, <laughs> community orchestras, um, that have performances just all over the place. And some of them, at where I live, we have some at noontime. Uh, most of them are in the evening or on the weekend, but there are a few, and actually the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra also um, does noontime concerts throughout the city as well. So there are lots of, usually lots of opportunities if you just, you know, pick up like a local magazine um, or even Google it, you can find those opportunities. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. Um, so I guess as we conclude, again, I want to thank you, Megan, for all the information you shared with us. And I just want to encourage everyone to go out and listen to some music. But make sure it's music you like. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> OK, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, there is a um, feedback form that if you're online, you'll receive afterwards. And we encourage you to give us your feedback. Um, it always helps us in our, in our programming. So thank you again, everyone, for 